Okay, so welcome. Uh, welcome to the last day of the workshop. So the first talk today is by Professor Ben Chen from Israel. She will talk about parameterization based mesh for mesh realization. So please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, it's unfortunate that we can't all be at Harvard, but I hope my background here of the Cambridge uh, uh, Commons will kind of uh, give us the right vibe of being at Harvard, hopefully next year. <laughs> um, okay, so today I want to talk about uh, mesh realization, and the problem is as follows. Given an input uh, digital shape, um, okay, given an input digital shape, uh, which you usually use a triangle mesh for, we want to generate some physical realization of it. And this can be made from cardboard or uh, from some sort of uh, mesh fabric, um, or it can either be uh, even 3D printed, but we are looking at uh, the surface print only, so some sort of lightweight 3D print. Uh, now it's worth mentioning that we're looking at the, the uh, realization of the surface only, so we're not looking at the volume. Um, so let's say standard 3D printing, well, uh, you can do today uh, for almost any shape in, in many materials is uh, like you see here, even in color, it's not what we are uh, currently looking at. Um, Right, so there are many, uh, many applications for this type of, uh, of realization. One uh, popular application is in architecture. So this is a structure that was uh, uh, built in 2014. It's made out of wood. <laughs> it's made out of wood panels. And in fact, uh, constructing with wood has become a very uh, popular thing recently due to its uh, lower environmental impact uh, compared to, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting things connected to my Bluetooth and then disconnected and it's interfering with my flow. So I'll just cancel that. Um, just a second. So uh, in architecture, working with uh, wood has become very popular because of, of its lower uh, environmental impact when compared to, for example, uh, steel and cement. So this structure is made out of wood panels, which are in the shape of uh, hexagons. So they have to be flat because it's wood. Of course. Uh, another uh, interesting application area is medicine. Uh, so here, what you see here are 3D printed stents. Uh, which are uh, customized for the patient, right? So you can uh, do some sort of uh, CT or MRI imaging of the patient and then extract the geometry of their veins and then build a stent that is specific to the patient. However, note that the geometry is very simple. So, you know, you could imagine doing this for some sort of curved uh, region or even bifurcation. Another application for such uh, uh, surface realization is, for example, in art. Uh, so this is an example of uh, mesh, wire mesh uh, sculptures done by students actually here in, in a studio in Israel. Um, so what, what are the challenges that we face when we try to do such a, such a realization? So first, uh, there's a question of existence, right? So not every surface has a realization in every material, obviously. Uh, so we have to kind of discern which surfaces we can work with. Uh, in addition, we want to build something which is kind of a, a framework, right? So it will be flexible for uh, different materials. So for example, if I work with wire mesh, then it can shear, but it cannot stretch. Uh, if I work with flat panels, then I know they have to be flat and rigid. Uh, I can work, for example, with the yarn uh, and build something with stuffing and it will have different properties. So I want to build a framework which, is, which will be flexible. Um, in addition, this thing has to be, the, the algorithm has to be as automatic as possible. So, um, for example, for the wood construction that we've seen, uh, generating this, uh, these panels is just the first step, right? Afterwards, you have to stick in them and, and perform some sort of finite element simulation uh, to, to, val to validate that they can stand the, the load and so on. So being able to quickly iterate on, on, on various designs and, and do this automatically is, is very important. Like we see here, like we have the tools and we generated many resolutions to perhaps 
uh, check the stresses for each one. Uh, finally, we want the, the algorithm to be robust. This is, of course, true for any algorithm. Uh, but in the case of realization, we want to enable many types of surfaces, uh, even if they have large curvature variation. So many, many uh, structures that you see in architecture are kind of tame, you know, the, the changes and curvatures are very small. Uh, but we want to be able to, to handle even, even uh, stronger changes. And, and I, I write here, you know, I call this to be robust to bunnies because uh, you know, the Stanford bunny is a good example of uh, a mesh, which is difficult because it has many, many types of uh, curvatures and geometries. Okay, so the framework we propose is uh, to work with semi-regular remeshing uh, to do the realization. What this means is we start with our digital shape. And then uh, we generate an intermediate surface, which depends on the material, right? So the intermediate surface is going to be some sort of semi-regular image of the input surface, where uh, the properties of the, the elements depend on the material. So for example, here I have, I want to generate this from wire mesh, which I know that it shears but doesn't stretch. And I have some sort of angle bound. So this translates into um, uh, quad mesh, whose quads will have these properties. Okay, so every edge will have the same length. For example, if I want to generate this uh, structure from wood, then I know I want uh, um, hexagons and they need to be flat. Uh, once I have this intermediate structure, then I can generate the realization from that, right? So this is the wire mesh and the uh, cardboard that we've seen. Please stop me if, if you have any questions. Um, or put them in the chat, <laughs> although I might not see them in the chat. So, you know, just barging. Um, okay, and specifically one want to work with parameterization-based re remeshing for realization. So the way this works is I'm, I take my digital shape, I generate another intermediate, and this is basically the flattening of this shape to the plane, okay? Uh, this again depends on the material that I wanna work with. And from this flattening, I generate both the remesh and the realization. And the reason to work with a uh, flattening, I'll, I'll go into it in a second, but it's quite clear that, you know, if my material is, is flat, that I can easily map the uh, flattening to the material and gen then generate the realization. Um, this would be a good time to uh, talk about related work a bit. And I'm going to kind of talk only about recent, very recent related work and only about some of it, because there's really uh, tons of stuff on, um, uh, fabrication in general and uh, uh, in, in these uh, areas that I mentioned before. Uh, so one uh, very interesting work or series of works is on auxetics. So here the, uh, the map is actually a control map which preserves angles and the, um, the material, uh, you introduce slits into the materials uh, and the, the way you do the slits depends on the conformal factor of the flattening. Right, so uh, this, uh, because you have the slits, this allows the material to kind of uh, adapt to the curvature. So uh, this is a very nice uh, approach, also parameterization based by uh, Mina Konakovic and collaborators. There's uh, of course the previous wire mesh design by Gar, Getal and uh, Max Wondetsky. Uh, there are also approaches that don't use parameterization uh, or remeshing at all. So for example, there's lots of work on developables recently um, so here you approximate the surface using uh, um, a few uh, papers cut together. Uh, and there's also additional work, uh, for example, for weaving that focuses, that also uses vector fields like we will, but uh, in a kind of a different uh, framework and without uh, uh, looking for the properties that we're looking at. So, you know, I'd like to say, yeah, using our framework, we can do any of these. <laughs> Uh, and this is maybe the, the end goal. You know? So one, one property of all these, um, uh, all these works and, and the other in, in this topic is that they're all tailored to a specific application and a specific material, right? So you have a paper for exotics and a paper for paper and a paper for weaving and a paper for wire mesh. And while this is an excellent way of generating papers, it would be nice if we had some general framework that is applicable to more than one material. And I'm not saying that uh, what I'm suggesting here today, we demonstrated it already as, as general enough, but I think this is in the right direction because of its uh, flexibility. Uh, so why do we want to flatten? Of course, like I said, we want to uh, realize starting with some uh, flat material. 
Um, and there is a nice relation between the material properties and because the material properties kind of imply which deformations they can sustain, right? So if I have paper, I can only bend it. If I have a wire mesh, I can shear it. So, so this tell me what are, tells me what are the allowed deformations and these map directly to the differential properties of the flattening. So this is a nice way to go from the physical realization to some mathematical description of, of what I'm looking for. Uh, right, so if I work with wire mesh, then uh, I end up uh, needing Chebyshev nets. And if I work with wood, uh, then obviously it has to be planar, but also um, the, the segments, for example, um, uh, quadrangular planar segments won't be as good as, as hexagonal because I want the mesh to be trivalent. So I want every vertex to have degree three because there's a nice statement about the stability, the kinematical stability of uh, trivalent patterns. Okay. So you start from the material, you get some uh, allow deformations, and these allow deformations translate into the differential properties of, of your flattening. Why work with semi regular flattening? Um, so, you know, as we said before, not every material is, is realized, not every shape is realizable in any material. And uh, specifically, if I only allow a single sheet of material, right? So, for example, uh, an extreme example would be paper. Uh, if I start from paper, the only de allowed deformation is bending. And the only realizable surfaces from a single sheet of paper are developable surfaces, which is kind of very restrictive. So one thing that we want to do is to, um, you know, trade off existence for this continuity. So we allow some cuts and able to kind of enlarge the space of, of shapes that we can achieve. But cuts are ugly. <laughs> so any place you have a visible cut, it, it hurts the aesthetics. And eventually a lot of these are for you know, for visual consumption, right? So even if it's architecture or art, or uh, I guess medicine it doesn't matter if you have cuts, but uh, if you want to look at it, uh, cuts are um, that displeasing. So um, a good compromise is to have some semi-regular structure where you allow seamless cuts. So what are seamless cuts? Uh, for example, here in the in the mesh fabric, I'm allowing the cuts. In the, uh, so I'm allowing a discontinuity, I'm allowing a cut in the fabric, but if I follow the lines of the fabric across the cut, they match exactly, okay? So uh, this makes the cut uh, much less visible, uh, that, that's seamless, uh, but it introduces these um, irregular vertices, okay, which makes the, the structure semi-regular. So this, this way I end up with a quad mesh, which has some irregular vertices of degree three or five or so. If I have a hexagonal uh, pattern, then I end up with uh, faces which are not hexagons. All the vertices will be degree three, but I have, because it's a dual uh, construction, all the faces will, will be degree, uh, all the vertices will be degree three, but I might have non-hexagonal polygons. Uh, so our framework is as follows. We start with um, our surface, which we call M. We build the parametrization. Okay, the parameter domain is going to be called U. And then on the parameter domain, we build this grid. I'm showing here a quad grid, but it can be a triangle grid or a hex grid. And then we map this grid using the parametrization back to our surface, right? And this uh, gives us the, the structure, the quad mesh structure of the uh, semi-regular image. Okay, so this is the general framework of parametrization based semi-regular image. You flatten the thing, you put a quad mesh on it, uh, uh, you put a grid on it, and then you kind of push forward the grid uh, back to the surface, and this gives you the quad mesh. Okay. Um, now, there's a, when we want to go to the to the math, right, and kind of give you know give names to these uh, to these beings, uh, it's actually more convenient to walk in the other direction. So I'm going to call uh, the map from the planar domain to the surface, I'm going to call it the parametrization R and uh, the, the map from the, from the bunny to the plane is going to be in the R in this. So this is all pretty standard. I'm sure you've seen it in the context of geometry processing. This is like geometry processing 101. Um, so in this framework, if I have the vertices uh, and the faces of the grid, right, VQ and FQ, so the, the black vertices are the vertices of the grid and the green face is the face of the grid, then I apply R to the vertices, this gives me points on the surface, and then I'm just taking the same face, and this gives me the full quadrant structure. Uh, now the way to get back to the material is to look at the, uh, the derivatives, right? 
So if I take the, the partial derivatives of the parametrization in the direction of u, uh, this gives me a vector field on the surface. And this vector field is parallel to the eyes of V lines, right? And therefore it actually prescribes the, um, the directions of the edges. So by controlling the vector field uh, u and the other vector field, the other partial derivative in the direction of v, which is parallel to the eyes of u lines, yeah, uh, then I'm actually getting uh, control on the edges of the quad mesh that I'm pushing for. Um, and these uh, uv, the partial derivatives, are called the coordinate vector fields of r. So these uh, characterize completely the differential uh, properties of the parametrization. And these are the, the things, these are the entities that I want to optimize for in order to generate my uh, image, okay? So uh, essentially the derivatives determine the local change when you take something flat and you force it to be curved, what are you allowed to do, right? So let's say uh, if I'm only allowed to shear, then the, yeah, we'll see, we'll see an example. Uh, so going back to our framework, in fact, I'm, it's like I said before, I'm starting with the surface, but now I'm designing these two vector fields, U and V, on the surface, right? And then I'm finding uh, parametrization R such that these vector fields are the derivative of the parametrization. Uh, then I'm continuing as before, right? So I have my parametrization R and then I'm pushing forward the grid and so on. And so so uh, essentially what you get is you put in constraints on your V and you get as output the shapes of the parts. So for example, uh, if, I, if I want the uh, Chebyshev net, if I want the, the shearing property, then I say that uh, the length, the pointwise norm of U and V should be one, okay? And these are the constraints that I place on U and V. And then as an output, I get that uh, the shapes of the quads are only rhombi. Uh, similarly, if I say that uh, U and V, the vector fields are pointwise conjugate, then I get as output a planar quad, right? So I can play with these constraints, it's very flexible. Uh, I can say, okay, I'm allowing shear only in one direction. I'm forcing U and V to be orthogonal. I can do many, many different things in this, uh, in this very general framework. But this leads to the following interesting question, right? So uh, I said, okay, so I'm finding R such that U and V are its derivatives, but does it even exist, right? So under which case, and the, what, what are the constraints on U and V, on the vector fields U and V, such that they are really the coordinate vector fields of some parametrization. Um, and this uh, condition is called the integrability of U and V, right? So if I have two vector fields, uh, does there exist a parametrization uh, such that they are the other fields? Okay, so in the smooth case, of course, <laughs> the definition is, is well known. Uh, the first thing you need is they have to be linearly independent. Uh, I'm adding here that the consistently oriented because you're gonna need it in the discrete case, but in the smooth case, it's kind of, uh, it's, I don't think it's necessary. But in any case, uh, linearly independent and consistently oriented means that at every point, uh, if you look at the inner product between uh, U and the rotation of V by pi over two, J here is the rotation in the tangent plane by pi over two, uh, you get something positive. So this doesn't degenerate, U and V are not allowed to be parallel because then the parametrization uh, is degenerate and they have to have a consistent orientation. Uh, the more, more interesting uh, constraint is the commutativity. So in, in, in the smooth case, you can define it in a bunch of ways, right? So uh, you can define it. So this D here is uh, an operator that says, if I have a vector field, uh, give me, I'm giving you a function, give me back, the directional derivative in the direction of the vector field, right? This is du, for example. This can uh, equivalently be posed in terms of, of flowing, right? So if I have a vector field that defines some flow for a particle that goes over the flow lines of the vector field, and it's actually easier to explain commutativity kind of uh, by hand waving <laughs> using the flow. So um, commutativity means that if I flow along for a very short time along u, and then I flow along v, uh, is and then I compare it to first flowing along V and then flowing along U, then if I get at the same point, then the vector fits for me. And you can see how this relates to uh, the existence of, uh, of a parametrization, right? Because you know, the thing closes, then the point that I integrate is well-defined. If, if, if I take different paths and I get different points, then it's not clear how to get from U, to the, from U and V to the parametrization. Specifically in the, in the smooth case, it's actually, uh, there are many definitions. 
So alternatively, you can look at the uh, definition through the covariant derivative. And then you're saying that the derivative of u with respect to u is the same as the derivative of u with respect to v. And as it happens uh, for many things in geometry processing, you have many smooth options for the definitions uh, and you have to pick something to, for the discretized version. So in this, uh, uh, in this paper from Sigrafesia, when we walked on Chebyshev nets, we chose this uh, uh, this representation of uh, integrability and discretized it. So basically, you discretize uh, the covariant derivative using, for example, uh, piecewise constant representation in a local basis onto triangles, and then use finite differences. So this is a standard way of computing the covariant derivative. Uh, you can use anything else, right? Linear finite elements or uh, any other scheme. There were a bunch. Uh, suggested in, in recent years. Um, now, the, the difficulty, so you can take any of these representations and kind of plug this into some optimization scheme and say, yeah, well, let's optimize for UV with this constraint uh, that this thing holds. Uh, the problem is, remember, we're looking for seamless, uh, so for semi-regular with seamless cuts, right? So for this, we have to consider something that's called the gridable parameterization. I have more than a single patch, so I have more than one parameterization and they have to agree. And the way this works is now, instead of having just U, I have U1 and omega one, and they map to each other through R1 and R1 inverse. And similarly, I have U2 and omega two. And again, uh, they map through R2. And now the, the condition that uh, these two parameterizations are actually consistent with each other. Like uh, the usual case you'd say, yeah, if, if I go, uh, from here to here and then come back, I have to come back to the same place. Otherwise it's not well-defined. But if I'm working with um, uh, semi-regular parameterization, uh, then I'm allowing uh, the map from, uh, so if I go using R2 and then back, then uh, I'm allowing any grid automorphism. So any rotation by pi over two or translation by an integer, right? So this is, uh, to, to do this gridable parameterization, you actually have to define what's, what's an integer. Yeah. Um, and now you have to take this, uh, this uh, restriction and kind of apply it to the discrete version of the covariant derivative of, or of any integrability uh, um, you know, scheme that you decided on. So um, if, if you look at UV on a local patch, this means that you know, if you look at the neighboring triangles, you can get on one side you have vu, and on the other side you have you know minus u minus v, and they are both uh, legal because you only know them up to this uh, grid automorphism. Um, so actually, you're not optimizing for uv; you're optimizing for a whole uh, bunch of possibilities per point. Yeah, you can have minus u minus v, all these four options. So you have some sort of permutation on uv per, per triangle. Uh, the nice thing is that the integrability constraint is actually uh, blind to this. So if you, uh, let's say, have u v and then uh, kind of replace it with uh, minus u minus v on the whole surface, then you know the integrability either exists or doesn't exist as before. So it doesn't change the integrability. And the same for any other permutation that we've shown. So actually, integrability is well defined globally, even if u v are only defined up to a choice of this uh, one of these four options per patch. But computationally, you have to make a choice per patch. This means that this theme that I shown earlier, you have to know it in advance in order to be able to compute uh, number u number v. So th the problem is that uh, number u number v are, are non-local, non right? Like you need the vector field in a region. And since this lift is pointwise, you might decide on different lifts for neighboring faces. So you have to make a consistent choice. Uh, in order to be able to compute this. I'm not going any into any more details about this uh, optimization because I want to talk about the, the other uh, integrability representation, but basically you optimize on this UV, but in fact, you're optimizing over all possible options and the objective includes the integrability, this unit length constraint and some smoothness, but the smoothness is defined on this uh, creature that includes of all directions at once. So uh, this, for example, is smooth to this, right? So you're, you're looking at the smooth method of crosses. Uh, and you have an addition angle bound because we said that this is what the material uh, has to support. Um, one problem here is because this integrability is only defined 
uh, given a choice of lift is you have to do this alternating uh, optimization. So you have to fix the set of uh, seams that you currently have and then compute the integrability, improve it, and then go back and kind of improve the seams and so on. And this is kind of uh, not very clean. So um, yeah, this uh, is represented using polling vectors, which I'm also not going to get into uh, today. Um, right, so this gives you some very nice results, right? So in, in general, it's, it's a good scheme, but it works so nicely because of this very specific uh, condition that you have that the norm is equal to one. Uh, so you can get shell structures, you can get the bifurcated stents that I was uh, alluding to before, right? So you see the, the singularities are placed at nice locations. Uh, you can get fruit packaging, which is of course an important application and uh, the, the bunny that we've seen already a few times. So this, this works, right? It's, it's, you need a, a good initialization, but uh, the optimization gives you back a good result. But like I said, uh, there are some issues with it. So the, the issue that bugged me most, I guess, is that the, the, the choice is kind of arbitrary, right? Like we kind of choose, okay, let's do, you know, Nabla UV uh, as, a, as a representation of integrability. So this is discretized and not discrete. So specifically, if this objective is not zero, it doesn't mean that I have a parameterization. It just means that the objective is not zero. So this is very, uh, you know, practically it, it gives you something, but it, it's not the correct thing to do. Uh, in addition, the way we handle this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, invariance to, to the choice of u, v minus u minus v with polyvectors is, is also not good because the space of polyvectors is too large. So you can represent any so the way polyvectors work is uh, you have a, a few directions, any number of directions, and every direction you look at it as a complex number and you represent it using uh, a, a, a complex uh, polynomial uh, with these complex shoots. So it's invariant to the choice of vectors. You basically can represent like this, any set of vectors. It doesn't have to be coordinate vector fields. It can be any set of vectors. So because the space is, is too large, you kind of wander around the uh, kind of the, optimization space and you don't necessarily get a good result. As I said, the flexibility is limited. So we kind of stuck with this constraint that the norm is equal to one and it requires extra work for free singularities because the integrability is only defined uh, given a choice of C. So uh, what we wanted is to have some sort of discrete integrability, right? So if I have a, a triangle mesh, and I'm, I'm going to zoom in here onto uh, some triangles and I pick two triangles. Now, if I, every triangle has its own map to the, to the plane, yeah, let's say Rj and Ri, then uh, discrete integrability is quite straightforward, right? It means that if I look at the edge, at the common edge Eij, it has to uh, map to the same place. So the pullback of Eij through uh, the inverse uh, differential map is the same whether I, I pick the purple triangle or the orange triangle, yeah? So this is really straightforward. Uh, the way to get back to the vector fields is to note that, you know, since these are the coordinate vector fields, by definition, these are the push forward of the axis of the one, zero, zero, one. And then the inverse map to the plane is just you plug in these vectors per face. Um, so we walk, I have minus one all over the place. The, the, the idea is you walk with a local basis, which is arbitrary, and then you get two by two, by two matrices, which you can invoke. <laughs> so if you com combine these two together, you have this uh, uh, representation of uh, the inverse parameterization through UV, and you have the consistency per edge. Uh, then you get that uh, two tangent vector fields are discrete, discrete integrable, on, if and only for any internal edge EIJ, you have this constraint. Uh, and you have to remember, you have to add the LICO, right? The linearly invariant uh, consistently oriented constraint so that you get uh, um, uh, something which is not degenerate and uh, by degree. So this is, is like really super straightforward. Yeah? And, and even in a special case, <laughs> If, if you think about it for a second, it's kind of easy to see that uh, this thing is equivalent to require, requiring that U and V are both curl-free. If you use the standard uh, edge-based curl by, uh, from the, um, um, where you work with non-conforming elements. Um, and, and of course, this is related to the existence of uh, 
of a function uh, whose gradient uh, are u and v, so you have two functions, et cetera, et cetera. So it's clear that the parametrization exists. Okay, so in the, in the very specific case that I have a global parametrization without uh, any cuts, then this is uh, kind of uh, easy to see that it's, it's uh, equivalent to this uh, very old result. Uh, now, the interesting thing is how we incorporate the grid automorphisms, right? So we want to enable singularities. We want to enable seamless cuts. How do we put this into this uh, representation of uh, integrability? Um, and the idea is, again, um, not complicated. So I have the map. I have, again, my two triangles. I have the map of the orange triangle. I have the map of the uh, purple triangle. And my constraint now is that the pullback of the common edge agrees up to grid automorphisms. Now, since I'm working in the, uh, with derivatives, the grid automorphism are, are only the rotations, yeah? rotations by multiple of, um, of pi over two, or if I'm working with some general n of two pi over n times k. Um, okay, so, uh, and I'm gonna talk about the integer translations. So, um, the, the constraint for uh, integrability, um, for gridable integrability, if I work with multiple patches and I want what now seems, is just that the pullback of the edge, of the common edge for every interior edge, uh, the pullback agrees up to rotations by two pi over n, by, uh, two pi over n times. And uh, this, uh, what I'm going to talk about from here on, we introduced in this paper that's going to appear in C-graph in a few months. Okay, so um, you take the, this definition for gridable discrete integrability, and you take the relation to vector field, which we, to the UV vector field, which is again easy and we've seen before, and you add some more salt in the sense that uh, you're looking at 2D vectors as if they are complex numbers. This is also uh, an old trick in the book um, introduced a few years ago already. Uh, by Keenan et al, um, yeah, Crane et al. Um, and, and the advantage of this is that you can get rid of this integer, right? So if you do this, uh, essentially you're saying, yeah, I get global discrete integrability, gridable discrete integrability of the tangent vector fields if the pullback to the power of n is the same on both sides of the edge. And you have to add uh, the liquid constraint and this is it, right? So this is a very, very, very simple constraint, which is kind of, far away from all this uh, discretizations of the covariant derivatives and so on. Uh, and we call these, uh, if two vector fields, UV, uh, precise constant vector fields on triangle mesh, if they fulfill this, so for every interior edge, this holds, and also I have the Lico constraint, then we call them coordinate power fields. It's like coordinate vector fields, but you take them to the power of n, so uh, we gave them the, the name. Um, Right, and now you can combine these with any other constraints that you might have, find your parametrization, build your realization, and so on and so on. Um, so the nice thing is that unlike the discretized version, CPFs actually guarantee the existence of a corresponding seamless rotationally quantized, quantized global parametrization, okay? So if the CPFs, if this constraint hold exactly, then I can find the parametrization. Uh, and the, the proof is in the paper, but it really does, does not. Uh, very interesting things going on there. It's really a straightforward application of this constraint. Okay, so one thing I didn't discuss here is integer translations. Um, unfortunately, these are not handled in this setting. So grid automorphisms, like I said, I can include the rotations by grid rotational symmetry, right, pi over two, um, and integer translation. And CPFs only handle the, um, the rotational symmetry part because they are differential, right? So they don't even see the translations. The way we handle this is we add, we solve for the integer uh, translation degrees of freedom after we're uh, computing the UVs in the integration step using a greedy approach that guarantees bijectivity. The details are in this uh, technical report. It's kind of similar to things that have been done in the past. Optimally, you'd like to solve for everything in the same framework. So kind of embed also the translation as degree of freedom somehow in this framework, but this, we haven't done it yet. Okay, so now you add a variety of, you know, your favorite constraints. Um, usually people want to do alignment constraints. So the, you know, the, the quads or hexes or whatnot are aligned with curvature directions. And this is also easy to do. So I have, I have some direction dj. 
then I um, look at the pullback again. And my constraint is that uh, the, the pullback of dj, if I raise it to, to, the, to the power of nj divided by 2, is going to be a real number. Um, and the reason is this is, and if this nj has to be an even divisor of n, right? So I can say, okay, I want the, um, the direction, I'm sorry, I want the direction uh, of the i, dj, to match to some greater direction, right? So let's say it's going to be uh, an edge of the quad. This means it's going to be the push forward of one of the directions of the grid here, yeah? So I can say it, it has to be a uh, four symmetry by taking NJ, NJ to be four. I can say it has to be a two symmetry by making NJ equal two, and it can be different across faces. So usually when you have alignment in, for example, in cross field computation, you have four alignment everywhere, right? Um, here you can vary. You can use different ends in different locations and we're gonna show how this is useful for um, planar hexes. Uh, you have an additional some smoothness, which is very similar to the, um, um, to the CPF constraint, but now you're looking at the orthogonal direction to the edge. So you're saying basically the edge has to map back, has to map exactly to the same location up to rotation by power over two, but the orthogonal direction, uh, it can map however it wants, but I want it to be kind of similar. So there is some smoothness in the system. I can also add constraints on the, on the metric, right? So I can say the, the norm of U has to be one under some symmetric positive definite uh, metric. I can add orthogonality constraints, again, using some S. So this doesn't have to be the identity. I can use this formulation to get conjugacy, for example, if S is the shape of point. So this, this scheme is very general, yeah? It's exactly like I've shown in the beginning. Give me UV, put on them some constraints, and then you'll get your parametrization. Uh, just to demonstrate, of course, assuming it exists, right? So this is like a computational thing. You might end up with something very far from what you want if you put constraints which are, uh, have no feasible solution. Um, so this is a, an example that I like because many times you do this, you say, okay, but what, what, is, your initial, what is your initialization, right? This is a nonlinear, uh, non-convex optimization. It's going to depend on the initialization. So here you start from a random initialization, which you see here on top. So uh, I'm showing the, the flow lines of UV. And this is the uh, initial uh, UV, and this is the final UV. And uh, we optimized here for, um, for smoothness continuity, which is the CPF, uh, the size, we use curvature sizing, which I'm going to talk about it soon, conjugacy, so you get flatness. There's no alignment, actually, and uh, orthogonality. Injectivity here is, um, uh, is the, the Lico constraint, yeah? So uh, while I'm optimizing, I'm forcing the... Uh, the, the vectors, the vector fields not to collapse. Now I'm saying a random in initialization, I should be more specific. So U is random and V is rotated by pi over two. So the initial um, UV are not degenerate. Yeah, this is, this is actually important. But U is random in the beginning. And if we look at the quad meshes that we get uh, from this uh, procedure, uh, they're quite nice. Right, so they're not exactly planar. I didn't run planarization on them, but I think that for starting from a random initialization and just you know <laughs> brute forcing it with uh, some uh, nonlinear optimization scheme, it's it's kind of, kind of nice. Okay, so in the uh, time that I have left, I want to talk about how we take this uh, CPF coordinate off fields and we use them for planar hexagonal meshing. And this is a good example because. Um, pH meshes are difficult, right? So we've been battling with this problem for a few years now already. Um, one problem is you have different grid layouts in different curvature regions, and specifically you have to use concave elements. So the parametrization approach is, is already difficult here because if I start from a grid in the plane, which has convex elements and I'm applying an FI map, it's going to remain, a linear map is going to remain convex, right? So I have to do something else to get concave elements. And these are required. So there's a, you can show that you cannot have a planar hexagonal watertight mesh if uh, all elements are common. So this is a problem. In addition, the directions and the anisotropy are highly constrained. So uh, we're going to see in a second how, but this is a very, uh, uh, it's a difficult problem. So the strategy that we're going to take is as follows. Um, we're going to compute some curvature regions. 
which of course it looks crappy because we have you know discrete curvatures. Uh, we use some standard uh, normal based uh, curvature. Uh, from these curvature regions, you generate uh, some constraints that give you uh, uh, an alignment uh, field. Yeah. Then you from from this you plug everything like you plug all the constraints into the CPF framework alignment and anisotropy and so on and so on, and you get a semi regular uh, triangle mesh. Yeah. The semi regular triangle mesh you dualize using a barycentric dual, and you get a semi regular hexagonal mesh. And then you just uh, apply planarization. So the last step of planarization generates the, the non-convex, the concave elements. But this mesh has to be exactly right for planarization to work. And we'll see in a second what happens when it's not exactly. So uh, first, let's talk about alignment. Um, again, this is complicated. In the elliptic regions, alignment is basically free. We're going to align in the curvature directions because it gives nicer hexes which are symmetric, but uh, you don't have to in principle, just if you just want to get uh, planarity. And you have six symmetry, right? So the, the, the grid symmetry here is uh, six fold rotation. If I am looking in parabolic regions, I have to have the, the, these direction be ruling directions. So the strip directions of the hexes have to be ruling direction, which means they have to be the minimal absolute curvature. So it's not the minimal curvature or the maximal curvature, it's the minimal absolute curvature which is uh, problematic for the reason I'm going to show soon. And it has only two symmetry. In the hyperbolic regions, it could be either minimal, uh, the hexes can be aligned either with minimal or maximal curvature, but I still have only two symmetries. So you see, it's very dependent on the curvature region, the type of uh, grid that I can, I can use. Um, so let, let's see what happens when you're not, you know, when you're not doing this, yeah, when the, the Parabolic regions, the hexagons are not nicely aligned. So remember, we're starting with some uh, semi-regular hexag hexagonal mesh and we're planarizing. And the planarization is just some standard, you know, shape up like uh, optimization that tries to push the hexagons towards the planar region, the, towards planar region. So I can say, yeah, well, you can optimize this and it will depend on the planarization that you choose, but this really depends on the init initial position. Uh, in the sense, it's very much like ICP. Like if you start on something good, you'll get planar region. If you start stuff on something crappy, you will get something crappy back. It will still be planar, but it won't approximate well. It will be far away from the input surface. Yeah. So here we see the strips of the hexes are nicely aligned with the curvature direction, the minimal, abs uh, minimal absolute curvature direction. And when I planarize, I get a nice, uh, a nice p hex mesh. The color here, by the way, shows the planarity value. So the planarity value, the way we calculate it, it's uh, normalized, so it's not uh, dependent on mesh size and so on. And of course, in the beginning, we, before we planarize, it's, it's high. Now, if we start, if you look at the other mesh, we're, we're not aligned with the directions, yeah? The, the strips of the hexagons are not aligned with the curvature directions. You can still planarize. You can feed it to the program and it will give you something. The hexagons will be planar, but like you see, it's, it's very noisy and it doesn't look like the input. So you have a very a large household distance from the input. So um, essentially this means in parabolic regions, I must align U with the minimal absolute curvature direction. Otherwise this whole thing doesn't work. But the problem is minimal absolute curvature direction is not smooth, right? So a simple way to think about it is if I have a hyperbolic surface where K1 is minus one and K2 is one, kappa one and kappa two, minus one and one, the absolute curvatures are one and one. And if I just compute, if I choose one arbitrarily, I'll get either the minimal curvature direction or the maximal curvature direction. They're both legit here as the minimal absolute curvature direction, uh, which means basically if I do this in practice, I'll get noise. So the, this is uh, something that's not trivial to compute uh, a field which is smooth and aligns with the minimal absolute curvature direction. So what we, what we do is a small optimization problem before we even uh, uh, compute the parameterization uh, on the CPF just for optimizing this direction and we call it the guiding field. So what's a guiding field? It's a two rosy. So it's a line field actually, it's not a vector field, yeah. Um, and we use the following constraints. So the, the guiding field constraints are as follows in parabolic regions, the red here, uh, it has to align with the minimal absolute curvature direction um, with two symmetry and in hyperbolic and elliptic regions, it can align with either minimal or maximum. So I set up this small optimization problem 
for to Rosie that, that does that. Uh, and I end up with a guiding field. And then I plug this as alignment constraints for the computation of the coordinate power fields. Yes, well, again, I'm using the, the setup that I've shown earlier. Parabolic region, the symmetry is two symmetry. And in elliptic region, I have six symmetry. And it's important to have this different one so I can have uh, different singularities because of the different grid structure, I can align, uh, allow different types of singularities in different curvature regions. And the fact that I can control uh, um, the alignment constant and I uh, is kind of vital for that. Now, this, of course, doesn't always work. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, we, there's a situation you can have geometries, which we call uh, conflicting cylinders. Well, actually, there is no smooth guiding field that does what we want. So in this example, in this region, uh, kappa 1 is 0 and kappa 2 is positive. So this is uh, an elliptic region. And then the guiding field direction is this blue thing. And in this region, it's kind of an inverted cylinder. Kappa 1 is negative and kappa 2 is 0. So this is the good direction. And there's no way to connect these two using a, a, you know, alignment, strict alignment, and, and that, that's also smooth. So what happens in practice is you get this, you get many singularities along the, this line, the, the interface. Oh, sorry. And then you get this the shapes which are not very uh, you know, pleasing hexagon shapes. But I think that in this framework, if you have to st stick with hexagons, there's not really no way out of it. One way may be to uh, work with combined quads, quads and hexagons. And in, in any case, this is uh, future work. OK, so we talked about alignment. What about anisotropy? Anisotropy is also interesting. So uh, again, this is the dual mesh. And this is the dual mesh after planarization. This is the planarity value. So you see that after planarization, we get a, a very nice uh, pH mesh. Uh, what's also interesting is that the hexagons before and after planarization in elliptic regions remain almost identical. So just the dual mesh itself, if, if my surface is completely elliptic, if it's convex, then I don't have to do planarization at all. So there's a specific anisotropy that I can plug in that will give me something planar to begin with. In um, parabolic and hyperbolic regions, I have to do planarization, yeah, because like we said, we have to end up with uh, concave hexes. And the way this works is the planarization pushes these vertices inward such that you get uh, the right shape. So it's not something we coded in, right? The, the only thing we code in is make it planar and make it uh, symmetric. And this is the way it kind of falls out of the optimization that you get the shapes that you want. Now, in order for this to work, you need the right anisotropy of the, uh, of the hexes in the dual mesh, OK? And the way to, to uh, kind of prescribe this is to look at the local hexagon geometry. So let's say we cut the surface with a plane, which is parallel to the tangent plane. So I take the tangent plane and I push it towards the surface. Uh, I get an ellipse here. If I have a parabolic region, I get two lines. And if I have a hyperbolic region, I get two uh, hyperbolic. Uh, in this case, I actually have to push this, the tangent plane both up and below the surface in order to get the two hyperboles. Uh, and these structures are exactly connected to the shapes of the hexagons that I'm going to get, right? Because how am I building these hexagons? I'm taking a bunch of points uh, near the, the tangent plane, yeah? And I'm basically sampling these, these regions. So in the elliptic case, I'm going to get a hexagon that's exactly shaped like a sampling of the ellipse. So what we want to do is essentially look at the dupin indicators. So uh, the, the definition of these um, um, ellipse lines and hyperbola, they come directly from the dupin indicators, which is a quadric that's defined on the tangent plane. So on a, in an elliptic region, you, if you look locally, if you parameterize locally the, the tangent space with your point at the center and the curvature directions as the uh, x and y axis, then your ellipse is defined like this. So, yeah, so kappa one, absolute value of kappa one x2 plus. And you have similar definitions for uh, all cases. But you see they are different, right? Because here, for example, I'm not, I don't have the absolute value. So now what I need in order to get the correct, uh, you know, the, the correct shape of the hexagon such that when I push things inward, when the planarization works, I get the correct shape is to have some sort of uh, regularized dupin. Yeah. So uh, in the elliptic case, there's nothing to be 
to be done. But uh, in the parabolic and uh, hyperbolic, I want an ellipse which has the same aspect ratio, let's say in the hyperbolic, has the same aspect ratio as the dupin, but it's an ellipse and not uh, hyperbolic. Okay, here it's more it's more delicate, right? Because the, the uh, this is degenerate, so you know how do I define an ellipse? That's not degenerate. Uh, so what are, I'm I want to define a epsilon regularized looping indicatrix, and my goals are as follows. First, uh, I want to get always an ellipse for any curvature region which has the same aspect ratio as the dupin. It has to be non-degenerate. Has to be identical to the dupin in, in, in elliptic regions. It has to be non-degenerate in parabolic regions, and there has to be a smooth transition between elliptic and hyperbolic. So what we do is we take the definition of the dupin indicatrix and we replace the curvatures with regularized curvatures, kappa one epsilon and kappa two epsilon tilde, and these regularized curvatures are defined using this function. So I'm taking uh, kappa one squared plus epsilon squared squared. This is like a standard trick and optimization to smooth absolute x. Yeah, so you approximate absolute x with the square root of x squared plus epsilon squared, and you get all the properties that you wanted. First, it obviously approximate abs uh, absolute x, absolute value of x, uh, it's positive and it's smooth. And by changing epsilon, you kind of can control the an anisotropy. So how far are you from the real dupin indicatrix? So this is the epsilon re regularized dupin indicatrix. Um, and using that, we can define the anisotropy that we plug into the CPF frame. Yeah, so we say our constraints are uh, the norm of UI with respect to some uh, metric GI and the same for VI is one. And this metric is given by this uh, regularized uh, curvatures. Well, in addition, we have a parameter gamma to control the element size. So uh, in this experiment, when I talked about pushing the the tangent plane into the surface, the, the question is how far do you push, right? So the further you go, the bigger your element becomes. So this is the gamma that kind of controls the element size. Uh, and uh, <coughs> so the, the and uh, still the epsilon is a regularized shape operator where I'm using the same definition of the shape operator, but I'm replacing kappa one and kappa two with these uh, regularized versions. So this is always positive definite, right? The shape operator can be degenerate, can be, uh, indefinite can be positive definite, but this regularized shape operator is always positive definite, and therefore I can use it as a sizing constraint in my family. So now you may say, okay, great, that sounds awesome, but I still have to set epsilon and gamma in a way which will be easy to set and kind of you promise robustness for any shape and the curvatures can be anything. So how do you set this up? How do you decide, you know, how much do you want to regularize? Um, so the trick here is to use intuitive parameters. So instead of talking about epsilon and gamma, you talk about two parameters which are uh, intuitive to control. First, the distance of the shifted plane to the tangent plane. How close do I want to be to the surface, let's say, in house of distance? This is controlled by delta, and this is given as a, as a percentage of the bounding box of the uh, surface. And the second parameter is eta, which controls the maximal element size. So in planar regions, theoretically, I can make uh, an element as big as I want, right? So eta tells me what's the biggest element that I, I want to allow uh, as a percentage of the surface. Of. And now there's a very simple, if you just look at the local geometry of this shifted tangent, then it's very easy to go to from uh, delta and eta to this epsilon and gamma. So you never actually give the user control of epsilon and gamma, they control these two uh, intuitive parameters and these are the only parameters in the system, okay? Um, so how do these uh, parameters affect the results? So for example, um, let's say I'm, I'm fixing eta, the maximal element size, which only uh, takes effect when uh, you have the general regions, right? So if the curvature is well-defined uh, everywhere, then the, the maximal element size doesn't kick in. So here I'm fixing eta and I have delta changing, uh, becoming bigger. So essentially I'm moving away from my surface with my tangent plane. And you see, there's a trade-off between uh, approximating the, the surface and uh, the size of the, so you have the, the size of the elements and the number of elements that you need, that you use. On the other hand, if you're keeping eta fix, if you're keeping delta fix and just changing eta, you get the same approximation in regions which are, um, which are well-defined, like the hyperbolic regions, but in planar regions, I can allow bigger elements. So think, for example, that you're an architect and you're designing this surface and you have this planar region, 
and you want to be able to control how big your elements are in, for example, because if they are too big, you cannot uh, produce them or whatnot, uh, then this gives you an intuitive parameter to do that. Now, if you fix the ratio, this gives you direct control over the resolution, okay? Um, so for example, here you fix the ratio of delta to eta, and then uh, you start with the regular torus. This is the picture I've shown before. On top here, you see the dual meshes before planarization, and here you see the planarized result. Um, and you can see the trade-off, right? So the, the blue axis shows the number of faces, and the orange axis shows the, the Hausdorff distance between the surface and the input set. So you can see the, the larger eta is, the bigger the elements I'm allowing, I'm using less elements, but I'm getting further away from the sets. And you can get like really, <laughs> uh, this, this walks kind of out of the box, even with very low resolution, which is, which is non-trivial, I think. Uh, I'm gonna breeze through orthogonality. So orthogonality of UV is not strictly necessary, but it improves fairness. If we don't constrain orthogonality, so here we are aligned with the curvature direction, but the U and V are not, orthogonal, you get these kind of elements, which are planar, they're fine, they just don't look so nice. If you do add orthogonality, then uh, you get more, uh, uh, you get better elements. So to, to sum up, you, you, uh, you optimize for UV using uh, the leak constraint and the CTF, and you take N equals six. You uh, combine uh, the alignment to the two rows guiding field, the dupin scaling, you also have conjugacy and orthogonality. And of course, you have to plug this in into the optimization framework, and then you have to take care of initialization and how you do the optimization and when you stop and what are the weights. And you can see all of that in the very long paper uh, because of all these details that hopefully we, we do supply them all. And we will also supply code, uh, code soon. Once you do all of this, uh, you end up with some uh, very nice meshes. So what we're showing here, the numbers are going to be the number of faces, uh, the maximal planarity error and average planarity error, and the host of distance. And you see here a variety of architectural surfaces. Uh, so I think, I think um, you know, the, if you look at any individual result, it's, it's nice. It looks like you'd expect not everything is like super perfect. Uh, there are uh, meshes which will, uh, you kind of can think of better results, but they were all computed with the same parameters using the same pipeline without intervention, okay? So uh, this is uh, kind of nice. Uh, also, it's robust to bunnies, okay? So uh, these are uh, general surfaces. So, you know, meshes that you see in graphics, you have the notorious bunny, yet another bunny, some teddy bear, uh, kitten, uh, fertility, a duck, you know, very, uh, a wide variety of, uh, of meshes, and you uh, can compute planar hexagons for all of them which uh, to the best of my knowledge was, was not achievable previously because of this difficulty in, in you know, the, the way everything is very constrained for planar hexagonal meshes. Uh, again, since this, this is uh, trivalent surfaces, you can do face offset meshes quite easily. Uh, and we fabricated one example. This is fabrication because you know, <laughs> I don't wish this to anybody, uh, but you can do this. Um, we, we just did it to show that it's actually flat. So you take your mesh, you generate this uh, 2D embedding with flaps, then you cut them from uh, cardboard. This is all done manually. Uh, my postdoc uh, Casper did this and it took forever. So, you know, you end up with this realization, but this is not like a practical way to actually fabricate. You have to think of a better way to do the connections and maybe to automate all of this. Okay, so, uh, you know, what, what's missing? Uh, we don't handle boundaries currently in a way that's uh, good. <laughs> so you end up with these jagged boundaries and if you're, if you're in architecture, you need your structure to be on flat land, yeah? So the input boundaries have to be preserved and this is something that we have to take care of uh, in the future. Um, I only talked about fixed N. So big N is the N that you push into the CPF constraint, the integrability, and you can theoretically define this per edge. This might give you weird things, uh, in the singularities, we didn't play with that yet, but it might have also interesting applications. Translational degrees of freedom, we really want to put this into the global optimization, uh, but don't know how to do it yet. You can add additional types of constraints, think about other materials. 
Eventually, physics is going to have to play a role. So now we're only doing geometry, but if you're serious about fabrication, we really have to uh, consider physics. Uh, so maybe kind of interleave uh, some sort of simulation with the, uh, with the shape optimization. And like I said, assembly and the connectors is also very neglected uh, and we need to do better there. I think there are many, many promising directions for, for future work here. So to conclude, uh, I presented an approach for fabrication of surfaces uh, based, from, uh, based on parameterization, uh, based on semi-regular remeshing that comes from parameterization. And the main idea is that it's uh, kind of general because the differential properties of the parameterization characterize the allowed deformations of the material. Uh, we introduced coordinate power fields, which is a robust and flexible framework for this, uh, doing this parameterization based semi-regular remeshing. Basically, it guarantees that the parameterization exists and you can kind of mix and match constraints according to your uh, application. And we've shown how to use coordinate power fields for planar hexagonal meshing uh, by doing this uh, regularized uh, Dupin scaling and uh, uh, the guiding. That's it. I'm happy to take questions. These are my collaborators, which I thank them greatly. No, thanks, Professor Ben Chen, for the excellent talk. So maybe let's. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have any questions for Professor Ben Chen? Again, question. Uh, what are you going to do? Hey, uh, no, that is. So about, I think the second topic you talked about, you had uh, um, these constraints for making the discrete vector fields integrable, right? Yeah. Um, so do you know like how big the set of, of maps that actually fulfill that is? I'm asking also because I saw you you later put that in sort of as a soft constraint, right? So is that like something? It's true. That, uh, uh, it's true that all the constraints that I named them constraints, it's it's a bit of a lie because they end up being soft constraints, so they go into the objective. Uh, yeah. But eventually, you do generate a parameterization. Yeah. So these yeah. vector fields exist. Any such surface that you see here comes from a parameterization, which has to come from this CPFs. So I believe the space is quite big. Uh, whether or not we do the right optimization to find it, I'm not sure. It would have been very nice to have this as hard constraint. Super nice. No, just, well, yeah. I mean, so I mean, the outcome of the optimization, so not necessarily it's going to be exactly an integer rotation, of, but it would be close or something like that. This is what happens in practice, and then the integration uh, forces it to be, um, so you actually solve for the rotation. Yeah, when you integrate, it has to be a seamless uh, parameterization. Ah. So even if it's not exact in, in the output, it has to be exact. Otherwise you cannot generate the grid. Yeah. Okay. Because otherwise the grid doesn't match up uh, if it's not exactly pi over two. So in the, in the integration step, then you force it to be exactly uh, seamless. Okay. okay. This is why I'm saying the vector field exists. Whether or not my optimization finds it, it's not clear, but it's there. <laughs> okay. Am I allowed another question? Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, so this is also, I think, very basic, but I don't know this application so well. So when you have, um, yeah, so you have these U's and V's again in the, in the discrete case. And then how do you, how exactly do you make, let's say, a hex pattern out of it or whatever? Like, how do you do the, you optimize so the you, you got the U and V, yeah. And then you optimize for the parameter function. Yeah, so you put it, you put it in the plane. You cut, yeah, you find on the singularities, you cut it and you embed it in the plane. Then you take the uh, triangular grid in the plane and you push it to the surface using your, your map, your parameterization. And then you have a triangle mesh on the, on the surface, a semi-regular semi triangular mesh on the surface. And then you dualize to get the hex mesh. Yeah? So from the UV, you get the singularities, the cuts, and the mapping to the plane. Maybe okay. it's a bit longer than a sentence. <laughs> yeah, well, well, you'll teach me some other time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, David Gu has a question for you. Hi, uh, David. David. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, really nice work. So I, I just want to add one comment. Uh, so recently, uh, we, we published work in computational mechanics. So we, we prove a theorem showing that uh, the singularities for the pod mesh actually can be treated as a divisor for some meromorphic differentials on the Riemann surface. So therefore, there's a 
uh, mm, a constraint using Abel theorem, very classical mm -hmm. algebraic curve. Yeah. So I think maybe that Abel theorem uh, constraint will, will be uh, equivalent to your constraints in some way. And maybe and that's something you can, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I'll take a look. Sure. Sounds, sounds uh, very interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for Professor Ben Chen? Okay, I don't see any. Okay, so let's thank, thank her again. Uh, thank you. And